Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpoli from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's special guest is Shell Hartzer and today's topic is integrated pest management. What does that really mean? So nice to have you back again, Shell. How are you doing today? Doing okay. How about you? Good, good. I'm very good. I was telling you that it's very, very hot in Manchester, unseasonably yeah. hot Manchester, England. No air con but we're surviving. And uh, where are you, just for the record? I am based in, in Georgia, in the United States, so just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Very good. Okay, and uh, as you are doing, tell us where you're, you're uh, joining from, Indonesia, Philippines. We, we get a lot now from Philippines and Indonesia. You're all very welcome, no matter where you're from. Uh, I'm going to play the sponsor's ads now, and then we'll be back for the presentation in a couple of minutes. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. All right, so Simon, I think you might still be on mute. Sorry, that there came we go. back. They, they ended early then for some reason, <laughs> the adverts took me by surprise. So anyway, I'll be back for the Q&A later and uh, hand you over to Shell. All right, welcome everybody. It's so fascinating to see uh, all of you from all the world. So good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I am Shell Hartzer. I work with companies to help them improve their pest management program so that they have fewer pest problems and put preventative uh, programs 
everyone's place. And the way you, you do that is through IPM, through integrated pest management. And that's a term that gets thrown around a lot. You've probably heard it. You've probably you know heard what it stands for, that integrated pest management. But really putting that program into place, really implementing it, um, it's a lot more challenging than it, it sounds. I mean, it, it sounds easy, you know, you integrate all the tools, great. But what does that really mean? And for most of you, I, I suspect that you have an external source, um, an outside company who's doing the pest management program. And for those of you who don't, you may have an internal division that's, that's actually performing the pest management tasks. But everybody at your site has a role to play because, again, we are integrating all of those tools that we have, all of those aspects of pest management to make the whole system work better and to really get to that preventative aspect. Instead of just reacting to pest problems when they happen, we can really start preventing a lot of those problems. And, and if not totally preventing the problems, finding them much faster so that we can prevent them from getting bigger and expanding and taking over the whole facility. So integrated pest management is just that, using all of the tools that we have in our toolbox. It's trying to think of how the pests work and what they need and where they might be so that we can prevent them from eating those foods and being where they are. And this is a partnership. Even though you have that side company or you have that internal division that is specific to pest control, everybody should be involved in this. And this is a bit of an audit requirement too. Pest management is part of, if you follow SQF or BRC, AIB, any of, uh, of the, the global audits, GFSI audits, pest management is part of that. And if you only look at pest management as controlling the pest and not the other parts of it, you are going to be lacking on some of this and, and your program is just not going to be as effective as it could be. So let's start looking at this. Again, many tools. We're not just spraying a chemical or we're not just, you know, trying to keep them out of the building. We are looking at the whole life cycle, the whole aspect of this. And that includes inspections that, that look for the pests themselves. I mean, we have to find the pests if they're there but also looking for those conditions that are bringing the pests in or enabling the pests to survive. We wanna look at sanitation. Sanitation is so important when it comes to pest control because pests need food. Just like every living thing needs a food source, the pests need that too. So if we can limit that, if we can even eliminate that food source, we can control those pest populations and keep them down. We also have to look at physically keeping them out. Can we seal up the building a little bit better and literally keep them on the outside and also trap them when they come inside? We're gonna talk about some of the different traps. And those traps are also monitoring devices. So this is our early warning system. I mean, we can, we can look at the facility and use everybody's eyes that are out there, but those traps, those monitoring devices are an extra set of eyes that alert us early. Because let's be honest, a lot of these pests, especially the insects, are pretty small and they like to hide. So just using a visual inspection isn't enough. These monitors help us find these things early and pinpoint where they are. Then we have treatments. Of course, when pests get in, when we have them, we wanna be able to treat for them but there's multiple ways of doing that. And if we do everything in combination, we can make those treatments better if we're looking at all the other aspects of the program. And communication, again, if you have that outside company or even you have that internal division, people need to be talking back and forth about what's happening, what needs to happen, who needs to do what, so that this system can work really, really well. Let's get to the next one, there we go. Um, so let's start with inspection, okay? So I, I like to kind of joke that inspection is easy. All you have to do is look at everything. 
But of course, that's what makes inspection so hard because how can you possibly look at everything? Even if everybody is looking around as they're doing their job, it is still hard to see everything. So have a plan, have an inspection plan, have people that do inspections every day, every week, every month, whatever it is. Your pest management company, those who are doing the pest management should be inspecting as well, but they're there once a week, maybe every other week, so they can't see everything either. So by using all the eyes and the ability, all the ways you can look, you're gonna have better results because then you'll be able to find those pests. You'll be able to find the openings that they may be using to come into your site. You'll be able to see the sanitation problems that they're using as a food source. So a little bit of training for all the employees at the site of just simple things to look for. If you see a pest, who do you tell? If you see a broken door seal, who should you tell about that to get it fixed? Um, use those eyes and have that communication in place um, to actually have that communication happen. So I wanna, you know, we talk about all the, the aspects of an IPM program, but really putting it in place what happens when you miss a step, I think is important. So I'm gonna tell you a story. This story is about flower beetles. This was a dry processing site. Um, so there was a, a lot of, you know, that food dust from, I think it was a cereal plant. They were doing breakfast cereals. And so they found flower beetles at the site. And so they inspected, they looked all around. They found some food sources, they found some sanitation issues. So they cleaned those up and then they did a, a pretty wide scale treatment. Flower beetles didn't go away. They still had flower beetles. So what happened? They missed an inspection point. There was this room, this was an electric room. And you notice those doors have those, those little vents on them. Well, this was a locked room that nobody had gone into, nobody had inspected. And that food material, that food dust had been pushed up under those vents. And when we opened those doors, there was a pile of food dust on the floor. And that's where all the flower beetles were, okay? The inspection failed because they didn't look in all the places that they could have. This was a locked room. And so nobody, nobody had ever thought to go in. It was locked, so that was it. So the solution to this was that the technician, the pest control technician who was there on a regular basis was given a key to this room so that he could go in, that he could find those issues. The room was also put on a weekly cleaning schedule so that massive pile of food no longer existed. And they were able to do a spot treatment just inside this room instead of treating the entire facility, okay? So when you miss that one step, when you miss that part of that inspection, problems can arise. And their treatment wasn't very effective the first time they did it because they weren't treating the right areas, okay? So that's what happens sometimes when you miss that inspection spot. And again, it's hard. How do you see everything in the facility? But this was a pretty big miss. This was a pretty big one that they, they did not see and they probably should have. Somebody should have said, what's behind those doors? How do we get in there? And they didn't. And when you're inspecting, the inspection shouldn't just be on the inside of your facility because many of our pest issues start on the outside and then they make their way in. And so we wanna look for um, you know, picnic areas, areas where the employees might eat food outside or hang around outside. Uh, where are your dumpsters? Of course, dumpsters are a great source of food for rodents and insects. So making sure the dumpsters are inspected and they aren't overflowing, that there's not trash all around the dumpsters, that it actually gets inside that. And also look at landscaping. Many of our pests, they like those overgrown areas, particularly the rodents, the rats, that's a very safe spot for them. So if you have a lot of these overgrown areas, cleaning that up can help. And, and I have here kind of these, these dumping grounds. I also like to call them graveyards. It's where people dump stuff outside. It's old equipment, it's old pallets, it's old containers, whatever it is. Um, and it sits out there because you don't really want it, but nobody's thrown it away. So inspecting those areas is really important 
especially if you can't necessarily do anything about those areas, inspecting them to make sure that you don't have pest problems and put those preventative means in place to address them. So that inspection is not just on the inside, that inspection should be outside as well so that we stop those outside pests from potentially making their way in. The next tool in our toolbox when dealing with pests is sanitation. Um, I cannot stress sanitation enough when it comes to pest control because the sanitation issues are obviously a food source for the pests, but they're also a habitat. The pests can hide inside of that. Take that big pile of, of food dust that I mentioned was inside that electrical room. The beetles were all inside of that. So if we do a treatment, how is that treatment supposed to get into there, into that, that food mass where all of those pests are? We also wanna look for a water source. Some of our pests, uh, particularly rats, need a daily water source. So if we can minimize the water, we can often minimize the pests as well. And by doing sanitation, we also eliminate some of those good smells, the, the things that attract the pests, potentially from the outside, or potentially from other areas. Okay, so sanitation is, is just like inspection. In a way, it's easy. You just have to clean up everything. But that's what makes sanitation so hard because you are producing a food. How do you clean up everything? You, you just can't do it. So when we think about sanitation, we also have to think not just about eliminating all of the food sources, but sometimes minimizing them, making them smaller. If those pests have to work harder to get at that food source, they won't develop as fast. They won't reproduce as fast. So even minimizing the food source, making that sanitation so that that food source is really small can be very helpful. Um, especially when it comes to insects and, and rodents as well. As I mentioned with inspections, we have to look at the side for sanitation issues as well. Um, this picture all the way on the left here, you see all that overgrown vegetation that's right up next to the building. All the rodents love this. It is protected. They are protected from the predators. There's probably food source in there. So often when we're thinking about sanitation, it's not just the food source that we want to clean up, but it's also that habitat source that you want to clean up. So if we can cut this vegetation back, if we can make it really small, then we prevent the pests from wanting to live there. So that's sanitation as well. We're cleaning up the habitat as well as the food source. Uh, that middle picture, I mentioned those, those dumping grounds, those graveyards perfect place for pests. And particularly uh, for food facilities, a lot of times these pallets, these old food sources can still have a little bit of food debris on them. So not only are they a habitat, they're a food source. So from a sanitation standpoint, again, having a pest control company to come in and identify some of this stuff to treat some of these areas is still your responsibility your site's responsibility to actually clean these things up. Your pest control company can't come in with a lawnmower and cut down some of that vegetation. Um, your pest control company, your pest control division can't go in there and remove all those old pallets. Dumpsters are a big one. I mean, dumpsters are a trash area. That's where you put your sanitation problems sometimes but you wanna make sure that the area around them is clean. You wanna make sure your dumpsters, trash bins are not overflowing. You may need to call your trash company and have them picked up more often. You may need to do some cleaning around the dumpsters to make sure any food debris that's outside of that, that is maybe leaked through is cleaned. And again, that's less of a food source to the pests. If we can eliminate or minimize that food source, we can reduce those pest populations. And when we can deal with those pest populations when they're small, it's so much easier than if the pest problems are huge and widespread. So here's another story for you. Again, I, I like to tell stories because this, this is how it applies. I can tell you that you should have good sanitation at your, your site, but what does that really mean? So here's another one. Uh, this particular pest problem was roof rats. And so the whole inside of the facility was inspected. Um, they did clean up a few of the food sources 
horses they found that they thought the, the rats um, were feeding on and they treated the problem. So they put bait stations on the outside with rodenticide and they put a number of traps on the inside, okay? Unfortunately, it didn't seem to work. Still had the roof rats, still had the problem. We're still seeing the droppings, still not seeing any reduction in that population. So what happened? We missed some sanitation. And in this case, the sanitation was that habitat. Roof rats, of course, like to be up high. They, they like to be in the trees. They like to be up on the roof line. And so what happened is around this facility, they had these, these larger trees that the roof rats were literally using as the highway, as this pathway. They'd climb up the trees, get on the roof, and then there were entry points on the roof. So it was inspected on the inside, but it hadn't really been inspected on the outside. So we missed the water sources on the roof because nobody got up on the roof. So when sanitation was done, they eliminated some of the water sources. When sanitation was done, they cut down those trees and that eliminated the pathway. So the rodents literally could not get up on the roof anymore and get into the facility. So the solution was actually pretty easy. It was sanitation. It was the sanitation of the vegetation, sanitation of those landscaping problems. Um, and and uh, to address the question of humidity, sometimes reducing humidity can help. Oftentimes in a food facility, that's really hard to reduce the humidity. But particularly for rats, rats need that daily water source. Sometimes if you can clean up the water source or remove it, minimize it, that can help. So humidity is, humidity is kind of tough to manage, but it can help a little bit. So this is, again, is the example of when something fails, when we don't have a part of the puzzle. In this case, sanitation failed, the sanitation of that outside vegetation. That moves us to exclusion. Um, we want to keep these pests on the outside if we can. Outside, they're, they're fine. They're doing their thing on the outside. We want to keep those populations low. But once they get inside, that is a huge problem. So let's see how we can keep them on the outside. And this is where exclusion comes in, sealing up all the openings you can potentially find. And for rats, a full grown rat can get into an opening that's only about one inch in in the United States, we always we always refer back to our quarter and our dime. If it's the size of a quarter, a rat can get in. If it's the size of a dime, a mouse can get in. And when it's just a crack, just a, a little bit of daylight that you can see, insects can get into that. So your responsibility is to find these areas and to fix these areas. Okay? Your pest control company should be pointing out when they see these areas that need extra ceiling that need to be closed off that need to be need to be sealed or screened or something you have to fix these though and again this kind of overlaps with that inspection piece of how do we find these areas you should be looking for them but also what you should be looking for doors and windows are of course the obvious one particularly personnel doors and dock doors like this um, <laughs> a, a full-grown rat can definitely into this. Um, however, um, the door had to be sealed shut. So think of the openings that are around your site. As you do your inspections, you should be looking for these and having them fixed as quickly as possible. That's on your list of things to do, not your pest control companies. Though some pest control companies will do some exclusion jobs. They will do some door seals. Um, so you can talk to them if this is something that, that they can do. But predominantly, it probably is something that you will want to do. All right, I told you I like telling stories about how this actually works in the real world. So this time uh, we have cigarette beetles. Um, cigarette beetles are, are pretty small. They like a lot of dried foods. They, um, uh, a lot of spices actually. I found cigarette beetles in, in totes of cayenne powder one time. It was, it was amazing. Um, so the site inspected. Okay. They, they looked all around. They thought they, they cleaned up the food source that they were doing. They did have monitors this time that were placed 
in key areas. And they fogged this entire warehouse. So this is a pretty big area and they treated the entire warehouse. Unfortunately, that did not seem to solve the problem. The cigarette beetles were still there. We weren't seeing populations go down. So what happened? We had the cigarette beetles. Um, sanitation was okay. They missed an exclusion point. So cigarette beetles, particularly in the United States, we have the natural outside populations. And so towards the late summer and the early fall, those outside populations are pretty high. In this case, there were some HVAC units, there were some air conditioning units on the, on the ceiling of the site, on the rooftop. And the last time they installed the filters, they didn't have the right size filters. So instead of getting the right size filters, um, they just took whichever ones they had and kind of shoved them in there. But it created a gap around the filter. So as this unit was pulling air into the facility, there was this gap around the filters and it was literally pulling cigarette beetles from the outside to the inside. So exclusion failed. But they finally figured this out. <laughs> they, they finally figured out what the problem was. They installed the, the correct filters in the correct way so that there were no gaps, no entry points. And the problem was pretty much solved. So again, missing one piece on this, missing one piece of, of this toolbox can result in problems. Now, again, this was on the roof. It was hard to see. Um, it, it wound up, we, we wound up finding the problem because of those monitors and and we knew where the cigarette beetles were showing up predominantly and finally somebody looked up and went there's a vent right above this area and that was the vent that was pulling them all in okay so exclusion is just as important we want to keep those pests on the outside I mentioned um, the traps and the monitoring systems that we have out there, your pest management program, your, your pest control technician, your company is putting these devices into your facility and they are checking them, they are monitoring them. However, you still have a role with this. You're not gonna check them, but you wanna make sure that they are in the right places, that you know they don't get moved that the holes are pushed up against the building, that the lights work correctly. Again, part of your inspection can be looking at these devices, again, not checking them, not, not taking the pests out of them or doing anything, but just observing that they are in the correct spot. Usually there's, there's some kind of little sign, a little placard that, that points to the location it's supposed to be in. So you can keep that there and, and and find out which device should be there um, and, may, and take a look at the devices and make sure they're working properly because a whole bunch of things can go wrong with these devices. And if you notice this, you can relay that information to your pest control folks and that they can bring the tools that they need the next time they come to replace these devices. So if you take a look at this picture on the left, this picture is, is a rodent control device, particularly for mice. And you notice a couple things. First of all, it's not pushed up against the wall. So when you watch rodents run, when you watch rodents inside a facility, they like to stick along the wall, that floor wall junction, because they're safe. They're tucked up against a corner. So if these devices are pulled away from the wall, the rodents will run along the wall and they will never encounter the trap. They won't go out of their way and come off that wall just to go into that trap. You wanna make sure that those are pushed up against the wall. I see this in a lot of facilities that the traps, you know, somebody has swept the floor or a forklift has clipped the edge of one of these and they come off the wall. So it's real easy to tell all of your employees at the site, hey, if you see one of these devices and it's not pushed up against the wall, go ahead and push it back up against the wall and put it back where it belongs. Because if this device is not there, it won't catch the rodents and then we'll have bigger problems in your facility. The other problem with this picture is this trap is obviously damaged and that top doesn't seal anymore. So if a rodent gets in there, that rodent can literally just push that top up and get right out of that device. So if you see broken devices, devices that are damaged, 
contact your pest control company and tell them which device it is so that they can bring a new one to the site that that you know actually works that middle picture is an outside bait station again a couple things wrong with this picture again that trap is not pushed up against the wall you notice that the the one arrow points to the hole okay that is where the rodent enters so if that hole is not up against the wall, the rodent will go over the trap, the rodent will go around the trap, it won't go into that station. So the two things with that picture are that the station is not up against the wall and the holes aren't aligned correctly. You can see this, you can tell your pest control company, they can fix this problem, or you can literally just move that trap up against the wall. Again, your pest control folks are maybe once a week, you can do a, a few of these things while they're not there and let them know if that trap keeps getting moved, keeps getting misplaced, maybe they can put it somewhere else that it will be more effective. Now, uh, the picture on the right is an insect light trap. Of course, we have that light. It's going to attract some of those night flying insects and get them stuck to that glue board. That way they don't get farther into your facility. This one has a few problems with it as well. We see two to the light bulbs that are out, that are not working. So this trap is not very effective because it doesn't have all of the lights working. Uh, the other thing I see quite commonly, especially now, um, is light traps will be unplugged because somebody needed to plug something else into that outlet. So take a look around your facility. Are all of your devices still working correctly? If not, that's when you get to tell your pest control folks, hey, we have this light that's out, please bring new one. So this can be part of your responsibilities, your inspection, taking a look at these devices. All right, so that leads us to, to treatments. This is always the last step when it comes to pest management because if we do everything else, if we do everything else well, our treatments can often be very small and very targeted. But if we don't do everything else, treatments can be totally ineffective and not work. And then you've thrown away a lot of time and a lot of money on something that isn't going to work because you haven't looked at the sanitation, the exclusion, the traps and the monitors. So treatments are the last step. And those treatments can vary. Again, something very small like, like bait placements for ants. You can do just a couple bait placements and that can often take care of the problem, especially when it's small or you might have to shut down the entire place and, and do a full-scale facility fumigation or fogging. Um, I would encourage you again, as part of the audit standards, if your facility goes through audits, you need to have an approved product list, an approved pesticide list. So talk to your pest control folks and make sure that they have that list and everything on that list is okay to use in your facility. This is, this is your site, so you need to approve that list. And with whatever you're using, we want to make sure that we don't contaminate any of the foods that are in your site or any of the food contact surfaces. Okay, we want to keep that, that food safe and, and free from all of those pesticides. Okay, pesticides are not a bad thing, they, especially if they're used correctly, if they're used in the right way, they're very effective and very safe. And this leads us to, again, the, the fact that this can be a preventative system. Your pest control folks are doing their part. If you're doing your part and having employees look around, look for sanitation issues, look for pest problems, uh, we can take the system and actually prevent most of these, these issues from happening. Or if they do happen, we can keep them small and easily managed. So when we think about prevention, what are we looking for? What are the potential threats? So we want to look at what pests are there. Um, in your particular facility, in your particular area, with whatever you are producing, what are, what are the food sources? What pests could be a problem and have been a problem in the past? Okay, so if we identify that, we are one step closer to be able to, to figure out which food sources they may be going for, where they might be coming from, and again, prevent that from happening. Your potential threats are also those sanitation issues. That's a food source, that's a habitat. 
So if you know where your sanitation issues have been in the past or where they could potentially be, you can keep an eye on those spots. And of course, exclusion. Okay, exclusion is always a potential threat. Um, you may you know, go around your facility and fix all of your door seals today, but a year from now when those door seals start to break down, that's a potential threat. Okay, um, then we wanna look at where the threats are. You may have a really large facility and in most of it, there's no chance of having pests because you have it sealed up well and there's very little food source. So maybe you only need to identify and really focus on certain areas, certain parts of your site. So where are they going to be? And I mentioned in that first example of, of missing a place to inspect, where are the areas that are hard to inspect? Where are the areas that you know, are locked or difficult to get to that nobody really wants to look at? Um, those are where your potential threats are gonna be. Again, that's where a sanitation issue is gonna get missed. That's where exclusion may not be totally tight. Okay, so look at where those potential threats are. Then we can also look at when those threats might happen. Okay, and if you are in an area that has four seasons, you're definitely going to see more pest activity in the warmer months. Um, for those of you without four seasons, um, you're going to see them in warmer times and in wetter areas. We also have climate events that are happening, hurricanes, floods, even droughts. These weather events will cause certain pest problem. So if you know that you just had a, a major hurricane come through, um, you know that you need to be extra aware of pests coming in from the outside because they've been displaced, they've been moved. So think about when some of these things are gonna happen. When you have construction going on, that leaves a lot of openings, a lot of exclusion points. So look at that, that system differently when you have things going on. And of course, when sanitation isn't happening, when you have those extra food sources, when you have those openings, that is definitely when pests are gonna go on. And so that brings us to what can be done. And we've talked all about this and, and I've given you a couple great examples of when it's not done correctly and how we solve those problems so it can be. And this is not easy. I, I can sit here and talk to you for, for 40 minutes here and, and tell you all these strategies, but actually putting them in place can be a little complicated. But if you're thinking through all the things that you need to do, all the things that your pest control company is going to be doing, and then and use all those tools together, you can have a really good preventative system. The key is to deal with those sanitation issues, try to seal up all the points, and then use the monitoring devices to tell you when things start to happen. Use your employees that are at the site and have them tell you when you see stuff. Um, and by using all of those tools together, you can make treatments more effective. You can actually prevent many of these issues. As I mentioned, it is complicated. I'm not gonna lie and say this is easy, that do A, B, and C and all of your problems are solved. It doesn't work that way. Everything is connected. And, and in, my, in my examples, I, I showed you what happens when one of these things is taken out of the picture, when we don't inspect well, or we don't have the right sanitation, we don't have the right exclusion points, that everything else around it can fail because of that. But it is complicated, and each site is a little bit different. Each pest is different. So you wanna try and look at the whole system and remember what you can do at your site and work with your pest control company with the folks that are doing the pest control to actually make that happen. So that communication aspect is really important to work together. Um, I like to, to say after we've done one of these presentations that everybody should go and update their resume because now everybody is responsible for pest control. So you are, you should put pest control on your resume, okay? You do have a role. Everybody at your site has a role and partnering with your pest control company will make this system really, really good. Um, I wanna put up my contact information. So um, I know we've had a lot of questions in the chat box. I'm actually trying to finish just a little bit early here so we can get to all of these. 
Um, but if you want, you're, you're more than welcome to reach out to me um, and, and ask any questions directly. I'm also on LinkedIn. So uh, if you have LinkedIn accounts, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. So um, I'm going to scan through the chat really quickly here um, and go back down to the, the bottom. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, question on methyl. Oh, go ahead, Simon. Uh, well, the first one that I saw was from Dali. Does humidity control help in pest management? It it can, depending on what your pest is, particularly for flies and rodents. If you can keep that humidity down, um, it can certainly limit how quickly they can develop and how many um, offspring they can have. If you're dealing with things like like beetles, um, some of the, the food pests that are, that are beetles, humidity won't have as big of an effect. So it, it really going to depend on your pests. And if you can control humidity in a lot of places, particularly big food facilities, we can't control the humidity very well. So um, two aspects to look at there is whether you can do it and which pest you have. Okay, and from Nandish, what pest does fumigation kill and which pesticide or chemical is effective? Sure, fumigations kill everything. <laughs> um, if we are talking about a true fumigation, we're talking about a gas. Gases penetrate and they will affect all the pests that are within that space that is being fumigated. Um, so, um, which pesticide or chemical is effective? That depends on which pest that de depends on which situation you're in. So um, unless, unless we know which pest, where it is, then we can determine which chemical is gonna be the most effective for that particular situation. So that's a really good question, thank you. Okay, Ishmael, how do we control vermin in drainage, drainages? Carefully, <laughs> um, you know, that is a water source and often those are going out um, out into the environment. So we wanna make sure that we don't pollute those. Uh, if there's a way to clean that drainage system a little bit and remove some of the food source. Otherwise, in a lot of cases, um, some type of screening, some type of prevention from letting them come up through the drainage system into the site can often be very beneficial. You just literally stop them from getting there. Um, you may be able to use some rodenticides. You will have to check the label and you will have to check with your local regulations on whether you can do that. But the first thing I would suggest is find a way to screen that drainage system so that the water, the material can still go through, but the rodents can't come back up. Okay, very good. Irene, uh, why is it that some rats uh, don't be trapped or die when poisoned? Sure, sort of two questions here. Um, rodents are very smart. Um, so if we don't put the traps in the right places and in, in the right area, um, they often don't go to them because they have other spots they like to go to so they won't go to the traps that's why pest management is is a little tricky sometimes we have to do exactly the right thing and put these devices in the right places um, when we do use rodenticides when we use those pesticides for rodents most of them are a little bit slow acting we don't want that rodent to die right there right when it eats it we actually want it to go back into its home into its burrow and die there so the the poison just takes a little bit of time to metabolize and to get through their system, and then it kills them back in their home, which is actually better. We'd rather see the dead rats outside in their burrows rather than inside right next to the, or, or right next to the bait box. Okay. Uh, does ultrasonic waves, uh, do ultrasonic waves help in controlling pests? No. Period. <laughs> I, I wish I had a better answer for that. I wish I had something different. They absolutely do not work. There's been research studies. Um, in fact, there's a, a, a big legal case in the United States that I, I think is ongoing that has shown that they are completely ineffective. So please don't use ultrasonic. It's, it's a waste of time and a waste of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what, uh, this is from Alarise. What should the size of air intake filter be to exclude cigarette beetles? Um, I can give you, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what the mesh size is, but most of your common HEPA filters are perfectly fine. Um, you know, if, if you can, you know, stick a pencil point through it, 
um, you probably want to think about a, a better filter. Most people are using the HEPA filters, and, and those are almost a, a material, so they cannot get through there. What you want to be concerned about is the space around the filter and making sure that filter fits really nice and snug inside that air unit so that they don't get around the filter. Okay. Uh, Homer, what about um, warehouse moths and red is that flower beetles or flower, yes. flower? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do want to be concerned about both the incoming raw goods that you're using and then your finished product. And so with uh, the moths and the flower beetles, they absolutely can come in on those raw ingredients. They can infest the raw ingredients that you may have in your warehouse. And again, they may potentially be in that finished product. So we have a lot of good pheromone monitors for some of these moths and beetles that can help you identify when they start to, to you know, establish themselves in your site. And that way you can treat those areas, you can find those infested products and get rid of them. Um, once the beetles get in, yes, is a spoilage issue and it is an infestation issue. Okay. Dalip, uh, effective way of installation, installing glue traps for arresting rats. Do you use glue traps for rats? Huh? Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is an interesting one for many people in Europe. You are not allowed to use glue boards. So I, I recognize particularly for Europe, glue boards are not allowed. Uh, we do still use them quite a bit in the United States. For rats in particular, I do not find glue boards effective. The rats are just too big. They just don't get stuck enough to the glue board. Um, for some of the smaller rodents, they can be effective. It is just like the traps. It's about the placement. Um, think of, of the room that you're currently in. If you put a glue board right in the middle of that room, that's not where the rat is going to be. The rat's going to be around the edges or, or it's going to be in the corners and the dark spaces. So the most effective way to use glue boards is to put them in those areas that the rodents are running through and put them in their pathway. Um, so I hope that sort of answers the question. That's that It's yep. actually a pretty complicated question to answer. Um, but if you want to reach out to me later about your particular situation, I might be able to help you a little bit more on that. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, if you have first, second and third defense, which are breached, then what measures should you take? Yeah, great question, because, you know, we talked about the outside and how a lot of our pests come from the outside. So we want that, you know, those bait stations on the outside. We want good sealing to keep them there. But, you know, occasionally it does happen. They, they come inside, whether that's from the outside or deliveries. So you're right in thinking of those different lines of, of defense. When they do get inside, that's the time you have to find out why so that you can prevent them from continuing to do that. Find out what food source they're, they're feeding on so that you can focus on those areas. And then again, with your pest control company, with your pest control team, treat those areas to eliminate the pest. Okay, Alaris. Uh is there a regulation or industry standard for light intensity of the insect light traps? Um, there is no regulation per se, um, it, unless uh, possibly in Europe. I, I don't believe so, but um, I, I will admit I'm slightly rusty on my European standards. The industry standard is not necessarily an output, but to ensure that the bulbs are replaced on a yearly basis. We know that the, the light output on a new bulb is the strongest. As it goes to month two, six, eight, that light intensity falls off. So the industry standard is to replace those bulbs every spring, because in the spring, those populations start to build up. You want that light intensity highest through the summer, and then in the fall and the winter, it's okay if that light intensity falls because you don't have as many pests. So um, not necessarily a, an output per se of, of an actual number, but make sure the bulbs do get replaced every spring. Okay. Um, can pest control measures harm livestock? Pest control measures can harm a lot of things if they're done improperly. Um, also having pests can harm a lot of things. So you're looking for that, that spot of controlling the pest without harming the livestock. 
and your pest control folks should be able to help you with this. Again, sanitation is a, is, is a bit harder in livestock areas because you have an abundance of food, you have an abundance of animals and, and waste that is going to attract pests. So you have to protect the livestock just like you would have to protect the food in a food processing site. So finding that, finding that balance. Um, it could if done improperly. So do it properly and you should have no problems. Okay, question from Chandra. Um, uh, if excess concentration of pesticide in liquid form does not kill the pest, what should be the optimum concentration for pesticides for flying insects? Okay. So already uh, exceeding the um, re recommended yeah. Dog. yeah. So my my question when people say that a pesticide treatment has failed, my first question is, you know, what was the past? In this case, we've got flying insects, I'm assuming some type of fly. And with that, how did you use it? So in this case, if we have flies and you're treating those adult flies, you have missed the larval population. You have missed the food source and the habitat. So while you're treating the adults, you still have the rest of the population that that, that liquid application it has not gotten to. So again, we go back to sanitation. Can we clean up whatever it is that they're living in? If we can clean up that, that source, that habitat source, we don't have the adult population. So with your question in particular, I would say it's where are you treating and have you addressed the food sources for this particular one? Okay, um, and from Kingsley, uh, what is the required height for electric fly killers? Great question. Um, there is no standard per se, there is no regulation. We want to make sure that insect light traps, um, electric fly killers are hung about eye level because when you think of the flight path of most of our flying insects, it's, it's about eye level, you know, five, six feet maybe. If you put it too low, they're going to be flying too high. If, same thing in inverse if you put it too high. Also, if you put it too high, I'm, I'm about, you know, five foot three. I can't reach that high to service it. So you also want it, you know, in that zone where it's easy to, to service it to make sure that you can take out those glue boards. So um, for the sake of this, um, probably about somewhere between two and three meters. You want it about there. Okay, great. And... Uh... How would you treat, uh, this is from Lavon, how would you treat a weevil infestation at a baking factory that has uncovered conveyor? Carefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a complicated one. I'd have to know more about your, your site. But in general, I would say if it is truly weevils, weevils are come from whole grain. So where is your whole grain coming from? And can we treat those areas um, if, if it is in your processing area, I'm suspecting it's not actually weevils. It's one of the other types of beetles. And in that case, we'd have to look where it is and, and which different treatments we could do in, in your area. So again, if you want to reach out to me, maybe with some pictures or some more information, I might be able to help you a little bit more on that. Great. Uh, and Lalit Kumar, um, for fogging of a warehouse, which chemical is used? Is methyl, meth methyl bromide okay for fumigation? Okay, so, so two different questions. We've got fogging, which is, you know, tiny little particles of liquid, and then we have fumigation, which is a gas. So for fogging, there are usually a couple different products. It depends on where you're located. In the United States, we have about three different active ingredients that could be used in a food warehouse. Um, for fumigation, for gassing, uh, methyl bromide is not used in the United States anymore. However, in your country, um, it may possibly be used. And methyl bromide, phosphine, and sulfurofluoride are the three major fumigants. All of them are very effective. You just have to do it correctly and safely. Right. Uh, any tips on uh, pest control risk assessment? That's from Magalis. Yep. Look at everything. <laughs> Um, yeah, for your risk analysis, you want to identify what pests you have or a potential pest, and that is based on your location, um, what country, what region you're in, and what food sources you have. So what are your raw ingredients? What are your finished ingredients? And then, you know, adding to that risk assessment, you know, 
where are your sanitation issues, where are your exclusion issues, and, and again, just trying to look at that entire system when you do that risk assessment, but really focusing on which asks and how they're able to get in, how they're able to establish. Okay, and uh, Chandra, uh, is there any system not to kill pests, insects, if entering the food production plant and instead removing them? Oof. Um, trying to, to think. I don't believe so because in just about all the cases, you want to contain them as quickly as possible and that usually means killing them, whether that's on a glue board, in some kind of trap, um, you know, some type of device that, that contains them, which, you know, ultimately does kill them. So I'm not aware of any systems that just trap them so that you could move them. Rodents, we, we do have that. Um, you have live traps that you can potentially trap them, then take them outside, but not for insects that I'm aware of. If anybody knows of anything, drop them in the tra chat box for, for Chandra. <laughs> Did you say rat box then? I'm sorry. <laughs> drop them in. Oh, it was just a oh, joke. Chab drop them in the sorry. chat box. I thought you said rat box. <laughs> right, sorry. Um, are birds part of pest management? Yes, absolutely. Um, just like rats, we want to keep the birds on the outside. And so that's where sanitation on the outside becomes very important. And not just from the food source, think of where they're nesting, think of where they're roosting, think of those trees, those bushes. And can we cut those back? Um, birds getting into a food facility is is a very bad thing. Um, the other thing you have to worry about is if you have lots of birds on the outside, the droppings and people walking through that and potentially taking that inside. So yeah. birds are absolutely part of pest management. And depending on where you are, you may have bird issues that could be part of your risk assessment and part of your pest management plan. Uh, Michael, are there any guidelines from the FDA around the use of food grade approved pesticides? Um, yes, uh, not necessarily from the FDA, but from the EPA. So in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency is the, the regulatory body that approves pesticides for use and they approve the label. So if on the label of that pesticide, it says you can treat, let's say, for example, wheat, then you are allowed to do that. If the pesticide label says, do not let this come in contact with food, you cannot do that. So it's not the, the FDA per se, it's the EPA and it's the label of that pesticide that will regulate how you can use it and on what types of food products. Okay, um, any effective recommendations to reduce lizard count? Okay, so what are lizards feeding on? What's the food source? They're typically feeding on insects. Um, so can we reduce the food source? Can we reduce the insects that are in that area? As well as habitat. Again, they, they like that, that more overgrown, they like that safe area where the birds and the small mammals can't eat them. So looking at their habitat and looking at their food source, reducing those. If they're getting inside, look at your door seals, particularly the bottoms of those doors to make sure they're sealed adequately so we keep them on the outside. Okay, great. And Ahmed, can I, is there a list of safe chemical used in fumigation against beetles in surfaces? Also, what to do to control flaws, salmonella to avoid beetle, which chemicals are safe? So, so basically, okay. is there a list of chemicals? Yeah. Um, yes, you would have to check what's available in your particular location. Each country has, has different pesticides that are approved for use. Um, for fumigation, if we are talking strictly fumigation and gas, that is methyl bromide, sulfur chloride, and phosphine. Those are the three approved active ingredients. Um, salmonella, um, if, if, if it is salmonella, not semolina, um, that's a whole different set of cleaners, disinfectants, uh, sanitizers, which again, I would check with your, your local regulations on those. Okay. Um... Is fumigation the best process for raw sesame? Um, if you are concerned about something, a pest being inside, then yes. Um, really, a fumigation is going to be the most effective because it will penetrate, that gas will penetrate throughout that. Um, 
as for most effective, um, most effective would be to keep them out in the first place and then you don't have to treat it. Um, but depending on what your situation is, fumigations are very, very effective because they do penetrate that, that system. Okay, uh, Mohammed, which KPI can we assign to pest control management system and what about data treatment and tendencies? Oh, fantastic question. So these are, this, this is where your monitoring devices really come in handy, um, all of those traps, because, you know, looking at what's baseline, how many, how many insects, how many rodents do you have trapped inside your facility? And what is your threshold? So, so I, I may say, you know, in my warehouse, it's okay if I find three meal moss flying around, but in your warehouse, Maybe you say, nope, it's it's okay if I find one, but if I find two, that's when I do something. So your KPIs are what you are gonna determine as okay for your site and per pest. So that's, a, again, a pretty complicated question. I'd be interested to know what your pests are, how, what your facility is like, and then you know setting those thresholds, setting those limits to, to look at do we see increases? Do we see decreases? But but key here, your monitoring devices give you that data and let you make decisions off of that. Um, best uh, chemical for general pests like house flies and cockroaches. Um, honestly, my favorite chemical is sanitation. Um, I would rather you know try and look at some of those underlying conditions first. And then depending on what the situation is, I will pick the best chemical for what's going on. Um, with cockroaches, in, in most cases, baits are very effective. Um, for flies, it depends on what type of fly you're dealing with and, and which, which particular product you may wanna choose. So, and it will differ by country, of course. Okay, question from Nate. Uh, Will spider webs in remote areas of a warehouse uh, cause a non-conformance? So you you have you have a pest in your warehouse. Um, you know you may see the spider, you may not see the spider, but that spider web is an indication of a pest. Now spiders are actually beneficial; they eat those insects that are pests. But still, from an audit standpoint, from a compliance standpoint, you have something foreign in your warehouse that should not be there. So I do recommend tearing down spider webs because they look messy and they attract insects. So um, knocking those down is, is very beneficial. Yeah. OK, Alaris. Uh, so for the flower beetles, can, can they be fumigated and does, it, does fumigation kill the eggs as well? Yes, so again, talking strictly fumigation, which is a gas, yes. You have to do it at the right concentration and hold it for the correct amount of time and it will kill the egg stage. But you have to get that concentration and that time correct for that to happen. Okay. Um, any suggestions to reduce rats in the warehouse uh, because trap and glue is not effective? Yep, um, so if they're already in the warehouse and you're trying to remove them, uh, look at where your traps are. Um, look at adding uh, bait, like a, a food bait, something good tasting to those traps to entice them to the traps. Um, and in, in my experience, when trapping fails inside, it's often because not enough traps are used and they're not in the right Place. So let's look at where the rodents are, where they're running, where, where they're, they may be living, and let's get traps close to them and let's get enough traps so that we can eliminate them. Okay, and from Kiki, once you have German cockroaches at the site for uh, some time, is it possible to eliminate them totally? And if so, how? Yep. Uh, again, fumigation is very effective, um, but fumigation is, is also costly um, and, and includes downtime. It is absolutely possible to eliminate them. It may take a little bit of time. Again, they didn't get there last night, so it's not going to take tonight to get them out. Um, but through sanitation, cleaning up their food source and and baiting in particular with with some other chemicals, again, integrating all of those tools in, you can absolutely get rid of them. Okay. And uh, when a rodent dies in its burrow or home, how do the other rodents respond? <laughs> 
Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, in most cases, they'll kind of just push it to the side. Um, rodents die and the, the other rodents are going to be thinking, OK, that's one less that's in my home. So a little bit more food for me. Um, they, they're really they're really not affected very much by by seeing a, a dead rodent. And in fact, a lot of rodents are, are cannibalistic. So they may even see that as a food source. Right. Ooh. Uh, just a comment from Martin Kelly. You might know him. Um, uh, Shell always provides such great presentations. She's trained hundreds, if not thousands, of IPM professionals, including me. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Good to see you again, man. <laughs> um, if raw materials eggs are present, sometime it convert into pest. Any detection method for eggs? insect eggs but. oh no no yeah. um honestly it's it's waiting until they hatch out and then hopefully catching the larvae larvae are very hard to catch too particularly if they're in a food source so really you're you're looking for the adults as, as they come out that's that's your indication that there's a problem unfortunately okay how do you know you have a roach infestation asking for a friend <laughs> <laughs> well, if you if you see the cockroaches, you know you have a problem. Um, the other way you can tell, again, I love monitoring devices. Monitoring devices, um, whether that's a glue board or some kind of, of roach trap with a little bit of a, a pheromone, a smell in them, um, those, those will find them often before you start to see them. So using those monitoring devices to tell you that there's a problem. So either monitoring devices or visual inspections. Okay, uh, pests. Uh, this is from BG Ravikuma. Pests usually get attracted towards light colored walls and ceilings. So, in one place, we fix black colored tiles mm. um, on the wall at entrance of the food factory. What is the logic behind this? Yep, uh, we do know uh, through research that different insects are attracted to different colors. Um, House flies in particular are attracted to a, a medium blue color. Um, we know that a lot of insects are attracted to light, which is why our insect light traps um, work. So it just depends on what insect it is, which color preference it may have. And, you know, it's, it's just like I like green and I'm attracted to green while you know, Simon likes blue and Simon's more attracted to blue. It's going to depend on the pest. <laughs> Hence your uh, nice ladybird logo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very nice. I was admiring that before. Um, <laughs> is sex reversal of pests, uh, does, does it help reduce pest population? Um, not sure I totally understand that question, but um, many of our insect pests, particularly our, our dry processing pests like Indian meal moth have a have a sex pheromone and we have been able to use that to attract them to traps and in some cases particularly with Indian meal moth we can use that sex pheromone to confuse the males so much that they cannot find a female if they can't find a female they can't mate there's no eggs there's no next generation so um we can use sex pheromones as a control method for some pests and I hope that that answers that question okay. a little bit. We're going to have to. We're going to try some rapid, rapid answers All now. Right. Ursula, Go. how often would you recommend the EFK glue boards are replaced? Uh, weekly in the warmer months, uh, every two weeks in cooler months. Okay, Rajneesh, distance of fly killer from the process. Uh, at least two meters from any food contact surface. Uh, Sofian, weevils in flower and there might be eggs as well in the store area in a baking factory, what could be the control measure? Uh, fumigation, or if your process, if within that process you have a sifter um, that the flour goes through, the sifter will pull out those eggs. Okay. Manoj, how about open air restaurants? How do we control flies and other pests? Very carefully. Um, fans will actually help um, air movement to actually push them away and very good sanitation. Do not let any food sit there on the ground for them to feed on. Okay, Perry, organic pest control. What is the most effective mouse control? Uh, traps. Uh, you can bait on the outside because the outside is not technically organic, um, but on the inside, traps are your best bet. 
Okay, uh, Claudian, how many times per month can we use phosphine in rice? Um, I'm not sure how many times you can. I wouldn't recommend it more than once per month because the life cycle of most of your pests is about 30 days. So doing it more than that just wouldn't be effective. Okay, Claudian in Latikamo is asking about egg detection. It's very difficult to detect eggs, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Yep. Um, Mohammed, what about staff training to recognize signs of infestation and good practice pest control? Recommended? Yes, do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Give, give them the basics of information of what to look for and who to report it to. Okay, David, pheromone traps are quite effective to monitor the quantity of pantry meal moths, but they only attract the females. Besides fumigation, is there any other type of trap sufficient against the males or both uh, besides fumigation? Yeah, you've, you've got that a little reverse for the, for the moss. It is attracting the males. Um, you know, the, the monitors are just that. They, they are to alert you to a problem and then you treat that problem. So you don't really need to attract everything. You just need to, you know, have a baseline and know where your thresholds are. Okay, uh, how about, uh, how do we prevent people from taking insects from home? A uh, great question. Carefully um, make sure that anything they're bringing in, particularly any clothes, uniforms, lunch bags, stay in certain areas um, so that they're not brought into processing areas. And again, monitoring devices will alert you to when a problem starts to happen so you can stop it. Okay, uh, background, any recommendations to minimize insects in outdoor barbecues? Any lights recommended? Um, yeah, for outdoor areas, I do recommend the electrocution style traps. Um, the light will come in, the, the light will be emitted. Um, but again, sanitation, be very, very diligent, very careful sanitation, and that will help a lot. Um, right, uh, if weevil, infested flower is fumigated, do the weevils vaporize? That you, you fumigated, you have killed it, but those dead beetles are still in the flower. And this is where your sifting process will come in to remove them. Um, but you do still have dead beetles in that flower. Okay, nice. Is there a legal requirement for phosphine residue limits in grains? Uh, you will have to check with your local reg regulations. In the United States, no, we do not have any, um, but check with your country. And on that note... Um, Did we get them? Done. Yeah, yes. we've, we've managed to uh, exterminate <laughs> the questions. all of the questions, uh, hopefully without anybody getting injured. Um, <laughs> so there we go. Uh, Thanks very much. And and there were some a lot of nice comments in uh, interspersed in between, you know, saying it's Thank great you folks. That was great. Uh fantastic. We've gone over by fifteen minutes, but it was worth it to get through the questions. And as uh Chiao mentioned, she is happy to uh follow up if anybody has specific questions about your process. And the slides will be emailed to everybody, so you'll see Shell's email on the slide there. Uh, okay, um, right then, is there another question? <laughs> Go on, last one. All right, all right. Uh, killing insects may affect agriculture, agriculture, agriculture yep. positively as well as negatively, and also create natural imbalance. What is your comment? Kill or save life? Yeah, um, I, I think it's always a balance. We do not want pests in our food, so if we can and focus on that small area, um, you know, the, the inside and keeping pests reduced and reducing the amount of pesticide, we still protect all of those good things that are on the outside. So looking at that balance and looking at ways to minimize by using sanitation, exclusion, inspections. Super. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Shell. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, enjoy your glass of wine later. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you for being on today. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. Cheers. Um, okay, uh, I've put your certificate in the sidebar, everybody, so you can download that. I'll send the slides and the recording in the next hour or so, and uh, we'll see you 
Uh, oh, it was heartbreaking seeing England lose the Euros. We forgot that, Shiva. Forget that. <laughs> uh, it's a distant memory. All right. See you next week, everybody. Thanks for your time and uh, engaging with us today. Thank you. Bye. Bye, folks.